Hello and welcome to this video on what is Cronbach's Alpha. My name is Christian Geiser. I'm an instructor and statistical consultant with Quantfish and on this channel I present weekly statistics tutorials. I usually talk about multivariate statistical methods including factor analysis and structural equation modeling and also about topics in psychometrics such as this one about reliability and classical test theory. If this is something that interests you, please subscribe to this channel. Also check out the description for additional resources, including courses that I offer for Quantfish. So in this video, I want to explain what Cronbach's alpha is. And so even if you think you know what Cronbach's alpha is already, it might still be worth watching this video because there are a lot of misconceptions out there about what Cronbach's alpha really is, what it measures, when it should be applied and so on. So, I hope you find this useful. Let's get started. So conceptually, what is Cronbach's alpha? Conceptually, we could say Cronbach's alpha is a coefficient that measures composite reliability for tau equivalent measures. Now, this already contains a whole bunch of stuff that we need to break down. So let's start with reliability. What is reliability? Reliability is an index that is derived from classical test theory that allows us to measure the precision of measurement in the social sciences when you have tests or questionnaire scales and you want to know how much measurement error is in your observed test scores, then the reliability coefficient is an index that allows you to quantify the proportion of true score variance relative to total variance. So, this formula here that is derived from classical test theory says that reliability is the ratio of true score variance, variance tau in the numerator, over total observed test score variance, which is a function of true score variance and error variance, variance epsilon i. The reliability coefficient ranges from 0 to 1. It's a coefficient of determination, such as r squared or similar to r squared, where zero means that 0% of the variance in the observed test scores is explained by the underlying true score variable, whereas a reliability coefficient of one would indicate that 100% of the variance in the test score variable is true score variance. And so obviously, values close to one are preferred for the reliability coefficient because they indicate that there's a large proportion of true score variance in the test score. So typically we aim to find reliability of above 0.8 or something like that, meaning at least 80% true score variance in our observed scores. Next, what is a composite? So in order to understand a composite, let's consider a situation where we have four different subscales of a test or four different subtests or items that are supposed to measure a common construct. So then when we have these four different test score variables that are all supposed to reflect the same construct, we could form a sum score or composite, as we say, by simply summing up those variables and saying, okay, we are forming an overall score or aggregate score for this test that consists of these four subtests or these four items. And now what might be of interest to us is the reliability of the sum. So reliability of S rather than the reliability of Y1, Y2, Y3, and Y4. So maybe we don't care so much about how reliable the components of our test are, but rather we want to use the test as a whole. We want to use the composite or sum score, and we want to know how reliable is the composite. And we'll see later in my example here that this makes a difference. So the reliabilities of the components are typically lower than the reliability of the composite. And so we may not care about the reliabilities of the components so much, but rather we would maybe uh, care more about the reliability of S. So that's what Cronbach's alpha is about, is determining the reliability of S, the sum or composite. However, not only that, but it's for a specific case where you have tau equivalent measures. So you can't do this whenever you have four items or four tests, they have to be tau equivalent. Now, what does this mean? Tau equivalence is a concept, again, from classical test theory, and tau equivalence comes with three assumptions. So the first assumption is that 
the measures share the same true score variable except maybe for an additive constant. So this would then be called essential tau equivalence if the scores differ, if the true scores for different components differ by an additive constant or intercept, meaning if they have different means, then this is called essential tau equivalence, which would be fine as well, or strict tau equivalence would be okay where they don't differ even by a constant. So the idea is they measure a single common true score variable with equal factor loading. So this is why the coefficients here in this path diagram for this factor model are set to one, because under tau equivalence or essential tau equivalence, the items have the same factor loadings or the components of the test. So that's one assumption that they measure the same true score variable. Second, that the second assumption is it has to be with equal loadings. And then third, they have uncorrelated error vari variables. So there's also measurement error in the scores according to classical test theory and essential tau equivalence or tau equivalence requires that the error terms are not correlated across different subtests or different items. So this shows you that Tau equivalence is a rather restrictive assumption. It means unidimensionality, meaning the subscores measure only one factor, one common factor, not multiple factors, and the error terms have to be uncorrelated, and the items have to have the same loadings. So they have to have equal um, factor loadings when you fit a confirmatory factor model with a single factor, which is the way to test this model as we will see shortly. So this is, so say what Cronbach's alpha means, it's a composite reliability index for tau equivalent measures. And so here's the formula for alpha, which is not super intuitive, but um, just so you can see how it's calculated. And then later we'll see that actually we don't do this manually typically. But so what goes into the formula for Cronbach's alpha is M. M is the number of components of the test. In our case, M would be four because we have four variables here, four different test score variables that we hypothesize to be tau equivalent or essentially tau equivalent. And then also we have the variances of our test score variables yi here, the sum of those four variances. And in the denominator, we have the variance of the composite or sum score. And so that way you could calculate Cronbach's alpha by hand. Typically we don't do that. We use a computer software program as I will show you at the end when we, um, when we go through our example here. So let's take a look at an actual data example. And so here I fit a model of tau equivalence to um, a cognitive abilities test that consisted of four subtests or subscores. As you can see in my factor analysis model, I fixed the factor loadings to one. In this case, I used M plus for estimating this confirmatory factor analysis model. You could also use Lavan or Amos or any program for structural equation modeling and confirmatory factor analysis. And so then M plus, as you can see here, gives me a set of parameter estimates for this model, specifically here the variance of the true score 38.503. That's the estimate of the true score variance. And then here we have the error variances um, on the right hand side. So those are the variances of epsilon that characterize measurement error. Before we interpret parameter estimates and Cronbach's alpha for a model of tau equivalence, we should first of all make sure that this model fits our data. So we want to look at model fit tests before we do anything about calculating Cronbach's alpha, because if this model doesn't fit our data, if this model is rejected, then Cronbach's alpha may not apply and may be misleading. And this is actually a step that people often forget. So oftentimes what people will do is they will just go to SPSS, they'll just enter Cronbach's alpha or request Cronbach's alpha in SPSS, and then they'll interpret it without first making sure that actually the variables that they use are tau equivalent or essentially tau equivalent. So then in M plus we have the advantage that we get a test of model fit and that's a chi-square test. This chi-square test tests whether 
the model implied covariance structure is identical to the observed data structure in the population. So we're comparing the observed covariance structure to the model implied covariance structure for a model of tau equivalence or essential tau equivalence. And so here you can see that the chi-square value is 1.506. It has five degrees of freedom and the p-value is 0.91. So this means this chi-square value is not statistically significant at the 0.05 level. And that shows us that this model does not have to be rejected. So there's not a significant discrepancy here between our observed covariance structure and the model implied covariance structure. And as a result, this model fits the data well. It does not have to be rejected. So in that situation, you can move forward and you can interpret Kronbach's alpha. Now, if this model didn't fit, if you got a significant chi-square value, then you would have to rethink your measurement model. Then it could be that either the variables are not tau equivalent, but rather just congeneric, meaning they still measure only one factor. However, they have different loadings. So you could test a measurement model with free loadings with um, loadings that are allowed to differ between the variables. That's called a congeneric measurement model. And then if that fits, you could choose a different composite reliability coefficient such as McDonald's omega, which applies to congeneric measures, whereas Kronbach's alpha requires tau equivalence. Kronbach's alpha would underestimate reliability if the measures have different loadings. So that's one thing to test. And then if also a congeneric measurement model doesn't fit, then you might have multiple factors that underlie your variable. So it could be that the scale is multidimensional, meaning a single factor model of classical test theory does not apply to these data. And then you'd have to rethink your whole factor structure and Kronbach's alpha would not at all apply to multidimensional scales. It could apply to each factor if each factor were tau equivalent. But when you have multiple factors, then you then it doesn't make sense to compute Kronbach's alpha across the entire set of items when these items measure multiple dimensions. In this case, no problem. Our model fits well, so we can safely interpret Kronbach's alpha. And before we uh, before I show you how you can obtain Kronbach's alpha, I want to show you that M plus will give you individual reliabilities for each subtest or subscale under R squared and other programs for confirmatory factor analysis will do the same. For example, in Lavan, you can also get the R squared values. And so the R squared values tell us how reliable each individual scale here is. And you can see under tau equivalence, the reliabilities can differ between the subscales because the error variances are allowed to differ between y1, y2, y3, and y4 with tau equivalence. And therefore you get different reliabilities potentially. In our example, the individual reliabilities vary between 0.573 and 0.708. So meaning between 57.3% and 70.8% of the test score variance here are true score variants. Now, these are not super impressive. As you can see, typically we aim for reliabilities that are a bit higher, so perhaps 0.8 or greater. These are pretty low. However, those are also the reliabilities of the components. And so each component may be a relatively short subtest with relatively few test items. And therefore, it's not surprising that each individual test is not so reliable. What we care about here more with Kronbach's alpha is the reliability of the sum. So if we form a sum score from those four components, how reliable is that? So let's take a look at that next. And so here in this case, I use the free JASP program, J-A-S-P, that you can download from the internet and it allows you to do reliability analysis. And so I um, selected Kronbach's alpha here from the list of um, scale statistics. You can see they also have McDonald's Omega. So in cases where your tau equivalence measurement model doesn't fit, 
and a congeneric model with different loadings fits, you could use McDonald's Omega in JASP as well. And that's really convenient. Also, SPSS allows you to calculate those statistics. And I have a separate video on composite reliability in SPSS as well. So when you choose Cronbox Alpha, um, then JASP will give you the following results for reliability. You can see Cronbox Alpha, the point estimate is 0.88, and it even gives you a confidence interval, which is nice. So a 95% confidence interval here ranges from 0.86 to 0.89. So it's relatively a relatively narrow confidence interval, which is nice. And the point estimate shows us that 88% of the variance in the sum score is true score variance. And you can see that that's considerably higher than were the individual reliabilities that I showed you on the previous slide. The highest individual reliability was about 0.7, whereas the reliability of the composite is 0.88. And that makes sense because we know from classical test theory that longer scales tend to be more reliable because when you have more items or more test components, then there's more opportunity for measurement error to average out. Remember, measurement error is unsystematic. Sometimes we overestimate the score, sometimes we underestimate the score due to measurement error. And so when we have multiple items or multiple components, then over time, those uh, over and under estimates, they'll average to zero more and more, which means that when you have a longer test, it tends to have a higher reliability. And that's reflected here in the fact that Cronbach's alpha is higher than were the individual reliabilities of Y1, Y2, Y3, and Y4. I hope you found this video useful to learn about Cronbach's alpha. If you did, then please subscribe to this channel. Don't forget to check out the description for additional resources and I'll see you next time.